Well, that's a good prayer to end with from Psalm 19. The words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, pleasing in the sight of our Redeemer and Savior, Jesus Christ. I begin this morning with a fact, a remarkable, stunningly beautiful fact. In August 2017, Researchers with the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO for short, detected for the first time the collision of two massive neutron stars. The waves that emanated from that collision were followed seconds later by a bright, fiery flash of gamma ra radiation and when the scientists analyzed the scans that they had taken, scans of the debris from this collision, they concluded that it had produced 236 sextillion tons of, wait for it, pure gold, which is 40 times the mass of our entire world, truly. The heavens are telling the glories of God. And if we could venture far enough out into space where there are 200 billion stars in each of 200 billion galaxies, maybe we could gather the golden dust wherever those 400 billion trillion stars collide. You know, if we pay attention, we can see the glories of God much closer to home. In his personal narrative, the theologian Jonathan Edwards describes walking in the pastures of his boyhood home in rural Connecticut and says, as I was walking there, looking up at the sky and the clouds, there came into my mind a sweet sense of the glorious majesty and grace of God that I know not how to express. And from that time forward, Edwards, who actually did a pretty good job expressing it, tells us that my sense of divine things gradually increased and became more and more lively and had more of that inward sweetness. The, the appearance of everything was altered. There seemed to be, as it were, a calm, sweet cast of divine glory in almost everything. God's excellency, his, his wisdom, purity, and love seem to appear in everything, in the sun, moon, and stars, in the clouds and blue sky, in the grass, flowers, trees, in the water, and all nature. For anyone who has the eyes to see it, this world is filled with the glory of God. And what I, what I want to give you this morning is the eyes to see so that your walk across campus today and every day will be everything before God that it should be. The beauty of the earth, of the God who made it, is the main first theme of the psalm that we have had sung and read for us, Psalm 19. Creation was made to give testimony to its creator. Or maybe we should say this, that through creation, the Creator has given us a testimony of Himself. King David begins by describing several characteristics of creation's testimony. It is articulate. That is to say, it speaks to us clearly. Just notice the vocabulary the psalmist uses to describe what creation says, both the nouns and the verbs. The, the heavens declare the glory of God. The, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. The voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. Declare, proclaim, reveal. Those are the verbs. The nouns are speech, words, voice. Each term describing something clearly communicated and plainly understood. Whatever this creation is telling us, it is something we can understand. 
When John Calvin went out to Lake Geneva on dark nights to gaze upon the stars, as he often did, he saw in them, he said, the alphabet of theology. Creation, he wrote, is a book written with large enough letters to read the knowledge of God. Creation's testimony so articulate is also incessant. According to verse two, the world has a lot to say about the glory of God. The speeches that it wants to give pour out day after day, night after night. The heavens and the earth refuse to be silent. They will be and they must be verbose when it comes to the beauty of their creator. And the psalmist gives us an example or two. Simply, simply look at the sun. They, the, the, the psalmist compares it to a rising groom who can hardly wait to meet his bride and to a long distance runner in peak physical condition who finishes the race that he starts in the heavens. Picking up at the end of verse four, God has set a tent for the sun which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens. Its circuit is to the end of them. Nothing is hidden from its heat. And of course, the sun is only one of creation's many witnesses to the radiant glory of God. Everything stands as a constant testimony to its creator. Here is John Muir, the father of our national parks, describing a scene that he witnessed one time near the Columbia River. He said the whole mountain appeared as one glorious manifestation of divine power, glowing like a countenance with ineffable repose and beauty before which we could only gaze in devout and lowly admiration. This incessant, articulate testimony is also universal, as, as universal as the rising of the sun. Everywhere you go in the world, creation has something to say. There's no speech, the psalmist says, where this voice is not heard. It goes out to the very end of the world. People of every tribe and tongue, every nation, every language understand what creation is saying. We hear it from the sun and the moon. We hear it from the starry lakes and rug rugged mountains. We hear it on this campus from the flaming trees and flower beds. What specifically are the heavens telling us? This articulate vocabulary, this incessant speech, this universal language, what is it saying? One good place to begin to answer that question is the first chapter of Romans, where Paul tells us that God has plainly shown us what we can know about him all over the world. His invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature, these have all been clearly perceived since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Apart from omnipotence, perhaps, the apostle declines to list more specifically the divine attributes revealed through creation. But theologians have taken their cue from this verse and have proceeded to name many character traits that God has revealed, his infinite knowledge, his sustaining providence, his matchless wisdom, his intrinsic goodness, and, and so on. When the Puritan Thomas Taylor considered the world's abundant variety of plants and animals, he said, here be millions of ministers and apostles sent by God into the world to preach to us the inexhaustible treasures of our Lord's goodness, wisdom, and power. But I think as much or maybe more than anything else, what creation reveals is God's beauty. Surely this beautiful world could only come from a beautiful God. And so it was that Augustine, surveying the wonders of creation, exclaimed, it was you, Lord, who made them, for you are beautiful and they are beautiful. And I could give so many examples from the church's great theologians who reserved some of their most beautiful words for this subject. They were like Haydn, who wanted to give the very best of his creative energies to the subject of creation. 
I could mention, for example, John Newton, the famous author of Amazing Grace. His observation of the natural world inspired him to declare in one of his letters that, that God adorns the insects and the flowers of the field with a beauty and elegance beyond all that can be found in the courts of kings. Or Jonathan Edwards, so often effusive in describing natural wonders, he described them as emanations of the sweet benevolence of Jesus Christ. But I'll settle this morning for Maltby Davenport Babcock, a minister from upstate New York. He used to walk out of the door of his manse and say to Mrs. Babcock that he was going out to see the Father's world. What a beautiful way to describe a walk out of doors. And he memorialized those words in his famous hymn, This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. Beauty, we might say, is one of the main love languages of our God. Some years ago now, students at one of the country's most secular art schools, Philadelphia's University of the Arts, invited me to come in and lead a Bible study. We met in the central school cafeteria, just welcomed anyone who would come, and we decided to start at Genesis 1, verse 1, and discuss everything that the Bible had to say about God as an artist, the original cosmic artist. You know, by the time we got to the end of the school year, we were still talking about the opening chapters of Genesis. Since there is so much the story of creation has to tell us about our creator. But we don't just learn this from the arts. Some of the strongest testimonies to the world's beauty come from what scientists say about their discoveries. One history of science I was reading about this summer concluded that beauty is a primary standard for scientific truth. And that sometimes the elegance of an equation can be as strong a proof for its validity as an, experiment, as an empirical experiment would be. One example of this is Watson and Crick working away in their laboratory in Cambridge, beginning to recognize the double helix structure of DNA. In the morning when they really came to their breakthrough discovery, they went off to lunch, and what they were saying to one another is that a structure this beautiful simply has to exist. And they were right about that. It does exist. And this compelling beauty has led many scientists to Christ. Recently, I read the testimony of the world-renowned astronomer David Block, um, he was pretty sharp. As a 19-year-old from South Africa, he was elected to the Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society in London. Not bad for somebody 19 years old. Moved by what he was witnessing, one day Bloch turned to his mentor and just blurted out, the universe is so beautiful, both visually and mathematically, he said. Well, his mentor was a devout believer in Jesus Christ, and he was help, able to help Block begin a journey that led him to personal faith in Jesus. Our own witness to creation demands a personal response. This beauty we see all around us, how should we respond, and what is our responsibility to it? First, I believe, attention. Pay attention to creation. This is what beauty is designed for. It is designed to be arresting. It is meant to stop us in our tracks. God has put his splendor into the world so that we will set aside everything else and be lost in its wonders. Psalm 145, on the glorious splendor of your majesty, Lord, and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. Wise Christians have always been intentional about slowing down and taking time to enjoy the world around them. It's a marvelous example of slowing down and taking time from the, the history of our own campus, from Clyde S. Kilby, the C.S. Lewis scholar who taught English literature here for some four decades, in many ways founded our Wade Center. In fact, some of our probably senior women are living just right across the street in Kilby House. 
Dr. Kilby made a personal series of resolutions, daily principles that he wanted to live by, and here was the first one. At least once every day, I shall look steadily up into the sky and remember that I, a consciousness with a conscience, am on a planet traveling in space with wonderfully mysterious things above me and about me. And here is Kilby's sixth resolution. I shall open my eyes and ears. Once every day, I shall, I shall simply stare at a tree, a flower, a cloud, a person. And I will simply be glad that they are. I tell you, that's a man who knew how to walk across campus. And even if we're not all called to be scientists, all of us can do what Dr. Kilby did and attend to the daily splendors of creation, which will not only increase our enjoyment of everyday life, but will also lead us to praise our maker. And that's a second response we should give to creation's beauty, turning our attention into adoration, letting these pleasures be for God's praise. I believe that's what David is doing in Psalm 19. The king says the heavens declare the glory of God. He's not simply describing something clinically. He's entering already into the celebration of it, which I believe is what the Bible always does when it talks about the beauties of creation. God is to be honored. God is to be praised. God is to be worshiped for the worlds that he has made. Jonathan Edwards rightly said, God is glorified not only by his glories being seen, but also by its being rejoiced in. You know, sometimes atheists and other skeptics talk about all the difficult questions they need answered before they will consider belief in God. The problem of evil, that's a big one. You know, unbelievers have some challenges of their own that they need to face. And one of them is the problem of wonder. Everyone can see the beauty in this world, even when it is broken. But does the skeptic who sees the beauty have anyone to thank for it? Anyone to rejoice in? How frustrating it must be to receive this gift of beauty and yet be unable properly to acknowledge it. And that's one of our privileges as believers in Christ. We know who to worship. We know who to praise. I like what John Piper says about this. We don't just stand outside and analyze the natural world like a, a beam of sunlight. We let the beam fall upon the eyes of our heart so that we see the source of the beauty, the original beauty, God himself. And Piper goes on to say that all of God's creation then becomes a beam to look along or a sound to hear along or a, a fragrance to smell along or a flavor to be tasted along or a touch to be felt along. And all of our senses then become partners with the eyes of the heart to perceive the glory of God through the physical world. A notable example of looking along the beam to perceive God's glory comes from a letter by Abigail Adams the second first lady of the United States. She was on a trip to Europe. Her ship was caught in heavy seas. The passengers, can't comment on the sailors, but the passengers were fearful. There was a calm that followed the storm. When Adams witnessed the stunning beauty of bioluminescent sea creatures surrounding the ship for miles in every direction. She looked out on, in wonder on this phosphorescent ocean shining in the night. And she found herself quietly murmuring these words from Psalm 104, words that she had known by heart. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, in wisdom thou hast made them all. And then there is a third response we should have to the beauty of this natural world, attention, adoration, and finally, protection. Because as believers, we have a duty of care to every beauty that God has placed under our dominion. 
And never, I believe, in the history of the world has creation care been a more urgent priority for the people of God than it is at this moment when human beings have such a massive influence on the natural world because of our numbers, because of our technology. And as a result of our actions and inactions, climates all over the world are changing. We, we see the consequences of our fallen condition and the accelerated scarcity of natural resources, the accumulation of climatic disasters. But we are also suffering this, a tragic loss of beauty. The melting of glaciers, the bleaching of coral reefs, the destruction of rainforests, the silencing of songbirds. One contemporary theologian calls this spiraling loss what it is, not only an ecological crisis, but also a failure of human beings to celebrate what God has made, which in, in turn diminishes our capacity to show forth the luster of the Holy Trinity. Such concern for creation is not strangely pagan, but deeply Christian, and it is nothing new. The best theologians have always regarded our God-given dominion over creation as stewardship of loving care. From William Wilberforce, who was nearly as concerned about the mistreatment of animals in his day as he was about the abolition of slavery, to Jonathan Edwards, who frankly regarded such animal abuse as a perversion of the purposes of God, thoughtful Christians have long sought to protect the creatures God has given into our watchful care. And they have done that for many reasons, including theological reasons. Listen to Calvin's logic. If I seek to despoil the land of what God has given it to sustain human beings, I am seeking as much as I can to do away with the goodness of God. Now, of course, it is true that God has promised to make a new heavens and a new earth. One day creation itself, praise God, will be redeemed and restored by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, this heaven and this earth, the ones that King David declared have been made to declare the glory of God, they are the only heavens and the only earth that we have in this meantime. And therefore we are called to protection. Maybe we are not guardians of the galaxy, but at least protectors of planet Earth. And we carry out this calling partly in the hope that others will join us in paying attention to the world's beauty and in lifting their voices to praise the God who made them. Beauty, too, has a role to play in reaching the lost. Our hearts desire as we attend, as we adore, as we protect, is for creation to do what it was designed to do and lead people to know the beauty of our God and to come to know Jesus Christ as creator and redeemer. Let's do some of that adoring now. The choir is gonna help us. Dante Ford is gonna help us. Let's stand to sing How Great Thou Art. Amen. 